very pleased to have a chance to talk to you. Um, my name is Tom Mount, and we're uh, in a conference room at Universal Studios. This is a 420-acre um, facility in Los Angeles that makes a lot of pictures every year under the branded name NBC Universal. It's been around for a long time. Um, I used to run this studio in another lifetime, um, kind of home for me. Um, and uh, we run a company called Reliant Pictures. Our company makes four to six motion pictures a year. We do that independently. We distribute primarily through MGM, occasionally through other studios. We have a foreign sales company based in London. We have a music component, a record output deal with Universal Music. We have a music publishing arrangement with Cherry Lane. And we are, uh, I guess, committed to the idea of exploiting pictures in ways that include music much more broadly than many of our fellow producers. You know, John, I got into this business at Universal essentially having no idea what I was doing, I guess like everybody, and, and the second picture I worked on at Universal was called Car Wash. That picture had a hugely successful soundtrack. In fact, the way we ended up in that situation is that a guy came to me, a music manager, with an idea of doing a play that took place in a car wash over a one-day period. And I didn't want to do the play, but I wanted to migrate that to film, and Joel Schumacher started writing a great script, and there were two R&B songs on the radio that I loved, uh, Heard It on the Grapevine and Papa Was a Rolling Stone. Those were my, at that moment in history, those were my favorite uh, songs of that genre. So I found out that Norman Whitfield had been involved in writing and producing and arranging both of those songs. and. Norman was just getting out from under one of Barry Gordy's famous 20-year contracts. You may remember those. And so I got Norman on the phone and said, look, would you write an original score for a musical, even though it's not a musical? I said, I don't know how to make a musical. I said, great, neither do I, so we're in good shape, so get over here. So Norman took a $25,000 advance, went to Pasadena, found three girls who were singing in a church choir, called them Rose Royce, dragged them into the old Studio B over here at Universal, and started recording the music before we finished the script. What he was working from was a script outline that told him what the scenes were and essentially what the main characters would do to each other. Before we shot the movie, we had the music finished. So I didn't know any better. I just didn't. And so I, you know, I, now everybody goes, well, that's backwards. but. We didn't know, so we took the tracks we had and we took them to the set. And every time we'd shoot a scene, before we did a take, we'd shoot the scene with the music playing loud so that everybody could hear it. Actors could get in the groove, people would understand. Then we shut the music off and do the take. Worked out all right. The picture cost us 1.8 million to make. The picture did about 20 million domestic, which in those days was a huge profit margin for the company. The soundtrack did $22 million on its own. It was a double platinum album. I was floored. <laughs> I had no idea. I was floored. I just, after that experience, how can you not take music seriously relative to film? And so while every film we make certainly doesn't have a lot of depth in music, most of them do. And over the years, we've had really good experiences with the relationship between the power of a released and promoted film, the power of radio, the power of record or CD marketing, and the ultimate relationship that all of this has to pop culture. So that if you're uh, around when we made Smokey and the Bandit, then in that country and western groove you could have uh, a kind of CB song, Jerry Reed kind of thing going on, and you'd be in a truck stop, or you'd be at the Varsity Drive-In in Atlanta, or some appropriate redneck hangout, and you'd hear all of the language and slogans and music from your movie two weeks before it opened, you know, in the air. By the way, the best leading indicator, car wash, 
before that movie opened, I, we had a preview at the National Theater on Times Square in New York. I went to New York, I picked up the producer and the director at the plaza. I was waiting for them to come down. I'm sitting in a limo, and a hooker comes over and knocks on the window. Hey, how you doing? I said, how are you doing? She said, I'm fine. I'm going to hang out here for the rest of the summer, and I'm going to go to Florida. And I said, great. And I said, she said, what are you guys doing? I said, well, I'm waiting for these guys. We're going to go to see this picture called Car Wash. We're going to preview it over here on Times Square. And she said, Car Wash, Car Wash. I said, hey, honey, that's that song I heard on the radio. That thing is bitching. I rolled the window up, and I thought, you know what? We're done. <laughs> I mean, if the hooker on the corner of New York already knows that the song is cool, then the kind of street cred necessary to make something pop in the culture was well on the way. So the rules for me are always work with people that are smarter than you are. It's easy for me to do. Find people who have true creative depth, put them together, and push the edge a little bit. It's very simple. <laughs> no, it wasn't. It's, it might have happened. Uh, you know, there had been films that by accident had had huge songs that transmitted to radio. High Noon had had Don't Forsake Me, Oh My Darling. It had been a big breakout song. Uh, Thunder Road had a song that broke out in the country charts. But nobody had done that before the movie came out. By the time Car Wash was released, I had three singles in rotation, two in the top ten. You know, as time went on, of course, that world became more sophisticated. Program directors took over from disc jockeys. As you know, in that 70s, you could still go to a DJ. You know, you could find someone who had a profile in their area, but the consolidation of the radio stations meant that the program director was now the dude, not the DJ, and it meant that uh, stations, of course, were part of networks, and many of these local stations, of course, had no local identity at all. They were just program pieces, and so it became harder and harder to work your way in. Years later, I was doing a picture called Where the Buffalo Roam, Billy Murray doing a kind of Hunter Thompson story, and uh, I had wanted for a long time to work with Neil Young, and we finally talked Neil into recording Home on the Range, and with a guitar and nothing else, just an a cappella version of Home on the Range, and it was beautiful, just beautiful. But I couldn't figure out how to get any airplay. What do you, how do you get home on the range on the air, you know? So one of my guys said, well, you know, I was saying, let's send, the, let's send this out. Let's get a single out to all these program directors. And the guy said, no, it's not ready. And they threw it on my desk. And it had a cover, a, a paper cover on it that said, test pressing, do not air. That sounds right. And I said, send it out. And I said, what are you doing? I said, no, no, no. Send it out, just like this. If we send out 3,000 of these, half of them will get played instantly. And so that's what we did. And, you know, the, the, even the program directors couldn't resist the idea of tweaking the record company's tail. And uh, so anyway, we've, we've just had a great time on the music side. It's been incredibly helpful to us. We don't make a movie at all without charting the music out very carefully to begin with. It's why in the company things like music publishing are important to us. It's why we work with artists who are inventive and we really look for them. Sometimes they're unknown, sometimes they're combinations of, of unknown and really skilled. In the picture we just finished in New Mexico called Dream It Out Loud, which stars Anna Sophia Robb and Caden Boyd, two 12-year-old kids. It also stars Val Kilmer, Heather Graham, Laura Flynn Boyle, Matthew Modine, and Dylan McDermott. It's a great cast. It's a really cool movie. Two things about that movie. Glenn Ballard did the score for the picture. Stunning, yeah. Academy Award nominee, guy who wrote, produced, and, and put out Jagged Little Pill. You know, there's a lot of landmark work. In, in Glenn's repertoire. He found an artist named Lisi, girl nobody's ever heard of, girl's 18 years old. She sings the songs in the movie. She's fabulous. Now she was unsigned. She was just somebody Glenn found. Now she's signed. Now she's got an album coming out. Now they're after us to pull the songs out of the movie to put on the album to cross plug. 
now Anna Sophia Robb, the actress, was talked into singing one song in an appearance on the Disney Channel. She's 12. She's actually now 14. She sang that song. It became the Disney Channel's biggest song of the year on their download service. So they said, you've got to do a second song. The second song became the biggest song in Disney Channel's history. So now we have Anna Sophia Robb and Lisi doing duets. We're we'll back in the studio redoing a couple of the songs so that we blend all of that together. Now, it's interesting and adventurous musically. It's also unbelievably good for the cross-promotion of a picture on every level. And it makes the experience of seeing the movie just much cooler, especially for the audience that film's designed for. It's a kind of my girl movie, you know, it's for a tweener audience. Um, and there's not a 15-year-old girl in America who doesn't know all about Anna Sophia Ra. You know. That is incredible. So we work on it. Doesn't mean we're always right, by the way. We screw it up as often as we hit it, but we work on it. There are people out there who really do it, but what happens to music and film all too frequently is this. Films are kind of hard to make, actually, much as I'm cavalier about it. There are a lot of damn work. Financing's complicated. The execution of the work itself is complicated. And if you make a good movie, it's sort of a miracle every time. And along the way, people run out of energy, and they run out of money, and they run out of focus. And so you get to the end of the movie, and most people leave soundtrack, score, musical issues, to the very last minute. It's death. You know, you do that, you end up in this spot where you're jammed in a corner, you've got a delivery date, you're out of money, you can't do much, you just do what you can. And that's all too often what happens. So we do it the other way. I'm talking to the composer at the same time I'm talking to the writer. Sometimes a tremendous role, frequently no role. Um, our experience has been just our experience that a lot of directors are not very knowledgeable about music and not very interested in music. They're interested in directing. Mm -hmm. I understand, I think that's great. Once in a while, I'll find someone who's, you know, got a real um, kind of, some genuine depth of experience in an aspect of music that's relevant. I did a picture some years ago with um, Andy Garcia and Richard Dreyfuss, Sidney Lumet directed, called Night Falls on Manhattan. And Sidney's a jazz fan all his life. So as we started that picture, he said, um, I want to get the entire Marsalis clan into this movie now. So we did. We went to Winton and everybody, and we got their dad, and you know, we ended up having a wonderful session and created just staggeringly good music. For, music's better than the movie, you know. But at least we were thinking early, and Sidney was on it, and it was his idea. It was a great idea. The flip side of that is, Many times you just scream up to the end of a movie and people's ideas about music are all too frequently shaped, from a director's point of view, by the temp track that you create in the editing room. And they'll fall in love with some pop single from their childhood. Pop, falling in love with a pop single from your childhood is like doing crack. You know, you might get high momentarily, but it's really at the expense of your intelligence and not a recommended formula for success. I, my view of that is we try to just disabuse people of falling in love with temp track altogether, try not to use much temp track. Every film, like every album, like every painting, like every play, like every novel, across the creative pantheon, all of these pieces speak to people they have a unique voice. They should, if they're working properly, make you laugh or make you cry or make you think or make you come, whatever they do, some variation of these things and sometimes more than one of those things, hopefully. So to find that unique voice, you need to back off of the kind of cliche platform and try to see what can be fresh and affecting. You know. If you go to a movie and 
your expectations are exceeded. Like you watch the first 20 minutes and you go, God, this is pretty cool. And an hour in, you haven't gotten up to think about popcorn or a restaurant. And you get to the parking lot and you're going, God, that was cool. I loved it when he did this and when she said that and blah, blah. And then, you know, then everybody wins. To get to that moment, music, film, visuals, hundreds of artists have to make contributions that are singular and remarkable and synchronized. That's why I do this, because it's not easy, you know, and because you have the challenge of trying to organize all of that talent and make it kind of head in the same direction. It's really fun. Well, it depends on the, what we're doing and who we're working with. Obviously, when we are soliciting a single from Neil Young, Neil's going to control his single. I'm not going to end up with a piece of Neil's publishing, and there's no argument there, and that's fine. When the artists are younger or just starting out, then we frequently own a piece of their publishing. We never take 100% of publishing, just won't do it. Even if the artist offers it, we won't do it. It's not fair. You know, at the end of the day, if you make a movie and there's good news, and there's a substantial waterfall of profit, if, I never want anybody feeling like they didn't get their share of this because they were weak or young or inexperienced. Just bad karma. So our hope is, of course, that every film's a hit. The truth is that most films aren't. What is true, though, is that there's a rich layering of media platforms for film and the music attendant to film. So that after theaters, of course, we have DVD and, you know, uh, pay television and uh, all of the cable systems and satellite systems and armed forces and airlines and all sorts of uses, right down to ringbacks and mobisodes. I was getting off a plane somewhere the other day in an airport and I heard someone turn their cell phone on and I heard uh, John Belushi from Animal House as the uh, ringtone saying, seven years of college down the drain. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's one of the great pleasures of this business, is that things you've worked on in the past, things you've created in the past, get renewed and have a remarkable life. In terms of the specifics with the musicians, um, we've made a deal on a picture recently with Burt Bacharach. Burt's doing remarkable new music. I just heard uh, six months ago, I heard a I think, when did we see each other last, John, about? It was in the spring. In the spring. At just about the time I saw you last, Bert had just finished an album with Dr. Dre. Did I tell you that? No. <sighs> so good. And Bert and Dr. Dre, hello. I mean, it's just great. Really? It's inventive, it's interesting. Dre sent Bert drum tracks to start this process. Bert listened to him and loved one. He sent, you know, now they're batting back and forth, they're working, and pretty soon it's on uh, Sony UK. It's out on Sony UK. That's impressive. It's very cool. But, you know, we're delighted that Bert wants to do a soundtrack with us, and we're thrilled. Bert keeps everything. He should. He's Bert Backrack, for God's sake. You know, and we're honored to be hanging around with the guy. Um, the flip side of that is many young artists rock band, singer, songwriter, etc., can build a career on the exposure they get in motion pictures and television from a single song. I mean, you and I both know people like, you know, the famous story of John Sebastian, who for many, many years, based on a single television intro song, could relax for the rest of his life. Um, and by the way, John had two of them. He had, uh, I believe, uh, Happy Days and Welcome Back Carter, if I'm not mistaken. I think so. Yeah, and I think that'll take care of it, you know. So, uh, from our point of view, from, just from my personal point of view, the rules are, I can't possibly keep up with music. You know, I don't, like, first of all, I'm old. Secondly, I work like a dog. I'm a guy in a suit in an office talking to bankers and moving money around and doing all the things I have to do. Once a week, I go to Amoeba Music here, once a week. 
I wander around the racks. I talk to the sales kids. What's cool? What's happening? What's not? That's my main source of indicia. I have a son who goes to college somewhere. That kid calls me periodically. Gee, Dad, this is cool and this is not. That's a great source of indicia. Whenever I travel, and I travel a lot, I turn on local television, find the local version of MTV, and try to listen to what they're doing and see what it is and what does it mean and what do you hear on the street, what's in the cafe. And Recently, I've been particularly impressed with the scene in England, which has just blown up. Amazing stuff going on. Really wonderful bands. Great opportunities to break out new music and a much and a culture that still embraces singles and musical performance in a way that American culture is kind of dumbed down. It's dumbed down, by the way, not because there are not lots of kids with good taste out there, there are lots of them, but their access to music is confined almost entirely to individual digital access. So they're on the net somewhere and they found a little song and they're swapping it around and that's that. The sort of uh, above ground systems of distribution and sales of music have become dominated so heavily by conglomerates whose interest is, um, let's say, their interest is not exactly in freshness and their interest is in heavily involved and understandably but regrettably heavily involved in exploiting those things that they think are the most predictable mainstream profit centers. The problem with that is nothing new happens. And after a little while it becomes very repetitive and very boring. And you know, you can build a big mid-range pop act, but that mid-range pop act, unless it has real creative invention somehow, either in the person or the people around the person, um, will die. What's fun about movie making is every time we get the challenge of a completely new introduction, a completely new take to the needs of music for that film. I've worked with some great music supervisors and I've worked with some awful ones. The best music supervisor I ever encountered was a man named Danny Bramson who worked with me for many years at Universal and then after I left the studio continued to supervise soundtracks. Danny was brilliant had unbelievable ears and better than ears, he had genuine, had a genuine emotional connection to the music. Danny then got scooped up by Warners and became head of film music for Warners and went a corporate route which you can't fault him for but it deprives me of access to that kind of enthusiasm. Um, I guess I look at music supervisors kind of like I look at casting directors. When we make a picture, usually I pick the first two or three actors. I call their agents, I call them if I know them, I send them scripts, I make the deals. So we're going to make a movie with, I made a movie years ago called Bull Durham and before I got the casting director to work, I had Kevin Costner and I had Susan Sarandon. On the other hand, a brilliant casting director named Bonnie Timmerman found Tim Robbins for me. I never heard of Tim Robbins at that time. You know, so that's a huge contribution. Music supervisors are kind of like that. I'll say, hmm, I'd really this is this feels to me like Bert Bacharach. I'd really like to work with Bert. I call Bert up. I know the guy. We sit down. We talk about it. He reads the script. If he likes it, we work out a deal. We start to move forward. But that's not the end of the conversation. If there's a music supervisor involved with some taste, they might go, hmm, Bert Bacharach. You know. Bert's never worked with X, and whoever X is, let's just say uh, Rob Thomas, I don't know, just pick somebody, is a fan of Bert's. And if we put those two dudes together, we might get some twist here where we need a kind of funkier direction in the music. And Bert would love it because he's a true musician, which means he's open to every kind of indicia. He's endlessly curious. He wants to know about it all. By the way, I'll tell you some, a scene I saw the, some months, some time ago, but a scene that just knocked me out. I was going through a Virgin Megastore in LA. Muddy Waters was in the Virgin Megastore in a wheelchair. Okay. 
being pushed along by an assistant. Muddy Waters was stopping at every bin and saying, oh, that, that record, that song on that, that song's great, I want that one. And then he'd go four feet and go, oh no, that song, not that album, that's the, the earlier one, yeah, that one, that song on that album, I want that. And the guy left the store with huge tubs of CDs, maybe hundreds of CDs. But what I loved about it was the appetite for the music. The thing about music and film that you can't deny is that both of them operate in a lot, in overlapping space in the human experience. They're both memorable, they're both emotional, they both uh, stick with you over a lifetime, they both have great pop culture hooks, and they both have the potential of elevating the quality of your life. On the music side for film, I'd say do the following things. Look around your community, whatever your community is. There'll be other young people your age making film. Find them. Look at all of their work. Pick the one who's smart. Pick the one whose work is interesting or groovy, even if it's tiny experimental film school stuff. You can tell. Take a look at it. Does it touch you? Is it smart? Does it get to you? Is it about something? Hook up with that person and say, let me do the music for your film. Whoever they are, they have no money. Whoever they are, they've maxed out their uncle's credit card and borrowed too much from their dad and their girlfriend sold their car and they're generally screwed up, you know? So they need music and they need it for free. And you have an opportunity to associate yourself with a cool piece of film and learn how to make it all work at the same time. And, you know, on the filmmaking front, I've always said, I mean, the filmmaking's terrible because it costs so much money to make a movie. But I always felt that if I couldn't raise the money to make a movie, I'd just rob banks and make movies, you know? Because they need to be made. And I feel the same way about music, you know? while it's not as expensive as film, thank God, and it's more accessible in that way, without stunning music, a film doesn't exist. It just doesn't. It's not a film. It has a sound component. It has a music component. Those components are utterly critical. So I'd say to young people, look around your neighborhood, find out who the hell is doing interesting work, jump on it, contribute something, take some chances, or if you can't find anyone making films around you, make one yourself. It's not so complicated, you know? Borrow your aunt's DVD machinery, you know? Find a camera somewhere, shoot something, try it. If you can't find anyone who wants to watch it, post it on MySpace, post it somewhere, put it up. Somebody will look at it. Maybe you get no response. If you don't get any response, then you have probably violated Billy Wilder's rules for filmmaking, which are the same rules that apply to music. And Billy had three rules. And Billy Wilder, of course, famous director who did things like Some Like It Hot and lots of remarkable movies. His rules were don't bore the audience, don't bore the audience, and don't bore the audience. You know. Good rule. Sure is. <laughs> All three of them. <laughs> my parents were not happy uh, when I went into the movie business. My dad is a lawyer from North Carolina, now deceased, but he was expecting that I go to law school and stay in North Carolina. You know, he'd built a law firm. It was a reasonable expectation on his part. The things I'd say are this. If you leave home to go in the music business or the movie business, you have essentially run away from home and joined the circus. Your parents are going to think that you're going to end up tattooed, drug addicted, and upside down in a ditch. That's just where they start. From a parent's point of view, what you need to understand is everyone needs, everyone who has the impulse 
that is an, an impulse that is fundamentally creative needs to have the room and time to discover if that impulse has cultural resonance. If it does not have cultural resonance, they'll be back and they'll become an accountant or a doctor or a whatever they're supposed to be, go into the family business. If, they, if what they do does have resonance, then they're blessed with an astonishing journey, an opportunity in life that's much bigger in its impact on the world than anything you as parents could have imagined for them. You know, think about Bob Dylan's parents or Robert Zimmerman's parents, as it were, in Hibbing, Minnesota. And think about what they thought about the impact their odd-looking, skinny, disaffected kid ended up having on the culture and the contribution he made to the culture. You know, So I just say, have confidence in your kid's creative instincts in the early moments. Of course, this doesn't mean that you should neglect any of the responsibilities of parenting. You need to keep a close eye on kids. You need to make sure they're not in water that's too deep. You need to help them in any way you can and encourage them in any way you can. And you need to beware, beware of the notion that creativity is somehow related to drug use. You know, it's a common conceit for kids who'd like to get stoned or screwed up for a weekend. Oh, well, I can write better when I'm stoned, or I can do this better when I'm stoned, which of course is nonsense. And it doesn't mean that there haven't been some great work done musically and cinematically when people were high, but that's an, that's an incidental effect. It's not the root cause of anything. Anyone who believes it's the root cause of anything is lying to themselves. I've known a lot of artists, a lot of artists, and all levels. I've never known one successful artist who actually believed that was true. So uh, um, I'd say to parents, try not to worry so much. I'd say uh, rejoice if they bring home something to listen to or something to watch that's exciting. Oh, I'm beyond optimistic. I love this. Listen, accessibility is wonderful. When I grew up in, in North Carolina, we didn't have an art museum in town. We didn't have any live music venue. The first time I saw live music was when the Tammy show came through and I got to see James Brown in a tobacco warehouse somewhere, you know. And all of that um, kind of cultural deprivation uh, I regarded as something I had to overcome in life. And so I had a lot to learn, still have a lot to learn, about film and music and art and other things to be able to do what I wanted to do. The stunning advantage of the net is that you can find things on a global basis. You can sample things, you can access stuff, and you can learn much more quickly. I think it has the kind of I think it creates a platform which allows a creation of an entire generation of artists who are much more sophisticated than we were. And I'm thrilled about it and I welcome it. Can't wait to see how it works out. I'd say be prepared to be broke and uh, hungry for a long time. I'd say stick to your guns creatively. I'd say Identify those artists who you admire, painters or filmmakers or musicians, whoever they are, and then go meet them and listen to them and see what they have to say. You know, nobody gets to be a serious artist without going through a process. And for many artists, that process is pretty tough. Very, it's very rare in my experience that artists aren't generous with other younger artists on the way. They are generous and, uh, across the board and if you're a young person, take advantage of that generosity. Our first rule is smarter is better. You know, 
if you know Shakespeare, it makes it much easier to talk about creative act structure in a movie. You get in a meeting with somebody and you say, oh yeah, I get it, that's like Macbeth. Well, if you've never read Macbeth, you don't know what they're talking about. Big disadvantage, so vocabulary is important. All the arts bleed into each other. They're all inexorably related. There's very little, it's one of the cool things about it, it's very little separation between film and music, painting, and novels, and theater, dance, very little separation. In many areas, they all overlap all the time. So I urge people always to try to have as broad an understanding as they possibly can across a, the pantheon of the arts. On top of that, it's a whole lot more fun if you understand a few things. You know, I was just reading Crystal Zivon's book about Warren um, called I'll Sleep When I'm Dead. Uh, and it's a difficult, interesting book. But one of the things that is funny about it is Warren Zivon predicated his entire um, oeuvre on uh, an articulated kind of writing. And Warren Zivon was a hugely literate man. Whenever he was on tour, the first thing he did was go to a bookstore. You know? So you see that overlap all the time. Tom, thanks for talking to me. Okay, great. Thank you.